Awesome, recording in progress. So thank you everybody for being here. This is the kickoff for 2023 Cosmic Conversations. We have with us our speaker today, Dr. Christopher Britt. He is an outreach scientist at Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, I'll let him introduce himself uh, in just a second, but I just want to thank you all for joining us as we talk today on UV astronomy and the Ulysses program. So go ahead, Chris. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so as, as Jesse mentioned, I'm an astronomer uh, here at Space Telescope Science Institute, working in the Office of Public Outreach with Jesse, trying to connect the, the science as it's happening into to informal learning environments like yours. So it's really great to be here to, to talk to you about you know what's new in the world of UV astronomy and why it's important. Um, we've heard a lot uh, lately about infrared astronomy and James Webb Space Telescope, rightfully so, uh, but uh, it's important not to forget that these whole other windows into the universe exist. Um, and so that, that's what I'd like to, to talk to you about today. Awesome, very cool. Thanks, Chris. I so I share my screen is telling me it's disabled, so. Oh yeah, let's, let's get him going to share his screen. You should be good to go now, Chris. Yep, there we go. Okay. So you all can see my screen now, I assume? We can. Perfect. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about ultraviolet astronomy, uh, and then in particular a little bit about a, a program called Ulysses that Hubble has undertaken as well. Um, but first, I want to talk about why ultraviolet astronomy is important, uh, especially from a, a space telescope perspective, uh, mainly that we can only do this science from space. We cannot do it from the ground. Um, and I'll, I'll, the reasons for that will, will become apparent. Um, just as a quick introduction, and I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum, having done some of the activities from universal learning on the electromagnetic spectrum, um, and uh, in your normal uh, informal ed lives. Um, but just to reiterate here, the visible spectrum is only a small part of all the forms of light that we can see uh, in the universe. Um, you know, when you split that white light into a rainbow, you've got the, the red through blue, uh, but then there's the colors on the other side of the rainbow that your eyes can't see. And on the red side, that's infrared light. Uh, and that's what James Webb has been studying lately. Uh, when the image behind me here was taken in infrared light. Um, but on the other side of the rainbow is ultraviolet light, and that's what we're going to be kind of diving more into. Um, and just as a loose proxy here, um, when we're talking about the different kinds of light, what we're really doing from a physics perspective is talking about different energies in the universe. When we talk about things that are high energy or hot, that's where we're moving into ultraviolet or even into X-ray and gamma ray light. When we're moving into infrared and even further into radio and, and uh, kinds of light, we're talking about things that are cooler. So I've put some uh, some images here of things that are approximately the temperature uh, represented by that best by that kind of light uh, on on the electromagnetic spectrum. And you can see furthest out into the infrared, there's some liquid nitrogen, really cold stuff, but it's still glowing in infrared light. So there's a lot of different kinds of infrared color. And it'll go all the way from something, the temperature of liquid nitrogen on the cold side, all the way up to something as hot as lava on the hot side. Lava is still mostly glowing in infrared light. It glows a little bit in visible light too. You can see it with your eyes glowing, uh, but most of the energy is coming out in infrared. Um, so those are the temperature ranges that infrared light probes. Um, and you may notice that there's a, you know, a nice sunny day at the beach there uh, on the infrared as well. It's because things that are room temperature, uh, like us or like the ground around us or Earth, um, are glowing at infrared light. What you're seeing with your eyes when you look at a sunny day at the beach is reflected sunlight. Um, but if there's no light coming in and reflecting off of an object, you can't use visible light to study it. Um, you have to use infrared. That's why night cameras will use infrared light a lot of times, because you can see it even when the sun's not down or when the sun's not up. Um, and then on the high energy side, when we move past visible light, past the surface of a star, for example, which is glowing really brightly in visible light, we can get to the hot spots on the sun. These uh, magnetic flares, um, places where the magnetic field is uh, wrapped up and twisted and accelerating particles to really high speeds. Um, so we're starting to go away from even the kinds of temperatures that our eyes can see up to the, the really high energy stuff. 
And we also have some resources helping to explore this, which Jesse may have shared or in the past as well. Uh, this one's on ViewSpace. It's an interactive slider where people can explore the different kinds of light in their day-to-day -day lives. You can see kind of the world around them as being illuminated by the sun's visible light. And as we move up to, infra to ultraviolet, we start to see that most things are dark, but what we're seeing instead are things like star forming regions, the hot spots on the sun. And as we move up further, we can see X-ray imaging machines like at a doctor's office. Uh, and then when we get up to gamma rays, we get to colliding neutron stars and solar flares and things like that, um, just stepping up in energy constantly. And if we go back down past visible on the lower side, on the red side, then we start to get things like fires and warm animals, um, you can see the ice water is very dark. Uh, the sun is still glowing brightly in infrared. You can still see it. And if we go down all the way to radio and microwave, we're kind of past the temperature range now. The things that we're seeing are, are using other kinds of emission mechanisms. Uh, so like the Wi-Fi in your router, um, distant pulsars in, in the sky, uh, the radio or TV tower are all bright radio sources. Um, in fact, if you could take your cell phone and put it on the moon, it would be the brightest radio source in the sky. Uh, so that's how bright the things around us are in radio wavelengths. So, um, and these are very low energy. Uh, there's kind of a fun fact about uh, how low energy radio is, uh, that if you were to collect all of the energy that we have ever collected from space for, in radio telescopes for the entire history that we've had radio telescopes, it would have less energy than the energy of a snowflake falling to the ground. Uh, at least that was true back in the 1990s. Uh, I think by now we might be up to two snowflakes, but it's, you know, it's close. So, um, but the reason we have to do some of this stuff from space, uh, ultraviolet in particular, is that we have an atmosphere that is absorbing this light around us. Uh, and that's a good thing because if we didn't have an atmosphere absorbing ultraviolet light from the sun, we would all get skin cancer almost immediately, right? And it would be very bad. Um, there was a, there's a ozone layer protecting us from the ultraviolet light, which is great, but it's bad for seeing ultraviolet light. So we really have to get up above the ozone layer and put our telescopes there to see it. So here's you know, some examples of some of the different space telescopes we have that are studying kinds of light that don't make it to the ground. Uh, and this chart kind of shows how far down to the ground each one can get. Um, so here's an example of some of the missions we have studying ultraviolet light uh, and some of the images that they have taken. Hubble is kind of the, the Cadillac for ultraviolet light. Uh, it's far and away the most sensitive UV instrument we have flying today. Um, and it's the only one capable of doing ultraviolet spectroscopy. Um, so this is, Hubble's really the flagship for ultraviolet. And there's nothing really like it or set to replace it uh, anytime soon, uh, probably until around 2040. That really depends on what the next mission parameters are. Um, some other missions are UV sensitive though, and they're useful for other things. Uh, for example, the SWIFT satellite, the, the Near Girls SWIFT X-ray Observatory. It's mostly an X-ray satellite, but it has ultraviolet capabilities too. And where SWIFT comes into play is that it's very fast. It's a SWIFT satellite. Um, and that means that uh, when something explodes in space, SWIFT can go point to it very quickly and tell us what its ultraviolet emission is like. Hubble takes a little bit more time to get around to something. SWIFT was especially designed to get to something fast and, and tell us about what was happening immediately. Um, so even though Hubble's much more sensitive than SWIFT, uh, SWIFT is kind of the the very fast uh, partner. And then uh, we also have a ton of archival data from the GALAX mission. Uh, this is on MAST uh, and is available through NASA's Universal Learning as well. Um, and GALAX was a, an ultraviolet mission that really had a wide field of view and set out to survey a lot of the sky. Um, so Hubble's kind of like a pencil beam um, and GALAX is more like a wide flashlight showing us the UV. It doesn't go as deep, but it's good for the kind of big picture survey stuff. And then Hubble comes in and, and specializes and focuses. Um, there are a few different areas where ultraviolet light is really important. Um, one of those is star formation. Um, so I have here an animation of a, a star forming. Uh, there's this dusty disk around it. It's really bright in infrared and radio, 
Um, but as the material falls onto the star and makes the star, uh, it gets really energetic and you get these light beams coming out the jets from the protostar. Um, and all the material that's falling in on the star gets really hot uh, and starts glowing in ultraviolet light. Uh, but these systems are how planets like ours formed. Uh, these systems are, are how we can understand the origin of our own solar system and Earth. And to really get the full picture of it, we need to be able to understand the ultraviolet part because that's what's happening in the center where the material is actually reaching the star. And because ultraviolet light is so energetic, it actually changes the chemistry of the disk around it. Um, you can notice that UV light changes the chemistry by just the fact that ultraviolet light will give you skin cancer. It's changing the chemistry of your DNA and can cause cancer that way. Um, well, it can also change the chemistry of dust grains and the disk around it that are making planets. Uh, so whether or not you know planets end up with an atmosphere depends a lot on their ultraviolet emission. Um, so if we want to study life out in the universe and we want to know what kind of habitats can support life, we have to understand the ultraviolet emission at these early times when planets are being made. Because if there's too much, maybe you don't end up with any atmosphere at all. Um, so it's kind of seeing the whole picture here um, is what we're, we're trying to aim to do. Um, and that's just the low mass stars like the sun. Uh, but when we start looking at these star forming environments like the pillars of creation where stars are being made, there's a web image on the left here and a Hubble image on the right. Um, low mass stars are being made inside the pillars themselves. Stars kind of like the sun are even smaller. Uh, but those pillars are being shaped by something, right? These are kind of like stalagmites sticking up out of the ground. Um, and they're actually being shaped by the winds of massive stars off screen. Off screen. Um, they're way up to the top above your computer screen. Uh, and the ultraviolet light from those massive stars is so strong, it's actually carving out these pillars. Um, so the ultraviolet light from the massive stars has a big impact on the environments where stars form. And just to give you some idea of like the scale difference between the massive stars and the low mass stars, our sun is a, a G type star here on the on the scale here. It's off, off to the left. It's kind of you know yellow, smallish compared to some of the big ones. Um, low mass stars basically means anything from like F down to M there, kind of the left hand side of the graph. Um, massive stars are those like the O and the B star up here, the really big, bright, ultraviolet bright ones. Um, and those can have temperatures you know, 10 times of the sun's surface temperature, uh, where they're just really bright in the ultraviolet. Um, but we can see these disks forming in these environments around us. Uh, these are, uh, on the left, are examples of forming stars with planetary disks in the Orion Nebula, um, invisible light. And you can see invisible light, these disks appear as dark patches, those little dark circle holes or how they look invisible. But when we look in radio light or infrared, they start to glow. And that's, that's on the right is an image shown with, uh, with Alma. So different kinds of light are telling us about different parts of the environment. The visible is telling us more about the interface and about uh, the, the nebula where it's born. Uh, the radio and the infrared is telling us about the disk itself. Um, and we can put this together with in a whole picture uh, with ultraviolet light. So kind of try and ignore the uh, the detailed text there. I just, I really want to call your attention to the, the arrows on the top. That's really what's important here. Um, is that as we're moving out from the star at the center out to the furthest parts of the disk, what we're doing is we're changing the most important wavelength to look at. Because again, we're changing temperature. So when we look at the center where the temperature is really high where stuff is actually crashing onto the star, that's where we need ultraviolet light. And as we move away from the star, we move further into visible light, into infrared, and then into radio. Alma there is a, a radio telescope. Um, so by combining these different kinds of light, we're really getting the whole picture. JWST is great, but it can't tell us about the very innermost parts of that accretion where the material is actually falling onto the star. For that, we have to have ultraviolet. Um, and to do that, uh, Hubble has undertaken this project called Ulysses. Uh, Ulysses is 
intentionally misspelled. It's like the ultraviolet legacy library of young stars um, as essential standards is what it stands for. Um, but essentially what this is doing is saying Hubble is not going to be with us forever. It's by far the best ultraviolet instrument we have. Let's make as much use of this ultraviolet observatory as we can uh, before it, it finally does end, end its life. Um, which, you know, is not going to happen, you know, anytime necessarily soon, we hope. Just, you know, we have it, let's use it. Um, ultraviolet is, you know, an important window for several different fields of study. Uh, and the, the mission really wants to maximize the science that can come from it while we have it. Um, so this is actually the largest Hubble program ever undertaken. It's about a thousand orbits. Each orbit is about an hour and a half. Um, so 1,500 hours of, of Hubble time is devoted to this. Um, and it's to study uh, the impact that young stars have on their environment in a couple of different ways. Uh, it's broken into two sections, really. There's the low mass star section and there's the high mass star section. Um, and those have kind of different reasons to study, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit. Um, but the main goal of Ulysses is to build this ultraviolet legacy uh, for scientists to come back to and use in the future, even after uh, the end of Hubble's mission life. Uh, it's, it's building for something for the future to use. Um, Ulysses is a spectroscopic survey. It does not deliver images. Um, so you know, if you're looking for really nice ultraviolet images to use, uh, Ulysses is not going to provide those. Um, instead, it's giving us spectra, which are really what's most useful for scientists. And so we're, we're trying to maximize the science that's coming out. Um, but of course, every substance you know, interacts a little bit differently with light, and each one has its own chemical fingerprint that it'll put on the light. Um, and so that's what we're trying to look at with Ulysses, is those chemical fingerprints. Um, so the first section, the massive stars, uh, can really shape their environments in very dramatic ways. Uh, so here's this kind of fly through of the, the bubble nebula that exists on, on Hubble site. Um, the bubble nebula is this blue sphere here uh, that's being created by the wind of a massive star that's crashing into its environment and heating it up, um, making it fluoresce. Uh, so what we're seeing here in the blue is fluorescence uh, from the ultraviolet light and wind from this star hitting its environment. Um, this wind from the high mass stars is what we are really interested in in the ultraviolet. Um, the wind of the stars shapes the future uh, of the star. Uh, it will help determine whether the star explodes at the end, whether it implodes. Uh, it determines how much mass it's losing. Um, and so that determines you know, if it's going to become a black hole or a neutron star. Uh, if it does become a black hole, how large that black hole is going to be. Um, the winds determine the future of the galaxy. Um, because since new form star formation has to happen in cold places, if you have a lot of high energy wind smacking into your dust cloud, it heats it up and then you can't form new stars. Um, so those massive stars can actually interrupt star formation. So this galaxy here, M82, it's called the Cigar Galaxy as well. This is at invisible light, looks fairly unremarkable, um, but there's a lot of ultraviolet activity in the center. And if we look at kind of a multi-wavelength view of this galaxy, you can see that the winds of those massive stars being made in the center are driving this gas and dust out of the galaxy. And that stuff is escaping. It's not gonna make new stars. So even though this galaxy is having a burst of star formation, it is in the act of strangling its, its own reserves to make stars in the future. Um, so wind is adding energy to the galaxy and interrupting new stars from forming. So if you wanna understand how stars, how galaxies evolve over time, you really have to understand the interplay between the stars and their wind and the galaxy around them. Um, there's a problem though, in, in that how strong these winds are really depends on what the stars are made of. Um, our sun is about 2% uh, stuff that's not hydrogen or helium. We call those metals. So carbon's a metal, oxygen's a metal. Welcome to astronomy. <laughs> the, uh, so the first stars in the universe were very different. They didn't have stuff like carbon and oxygen yet. They didn't have these metals. Um, instead, they were just purely hydrogen and helium. That means that their winds were very, very different from today. So if we want to be able to understand how the very first stars 
influence their host galaxies, uh, then we have to be able to study the winds of metal poor stars. And there are a few places we can do that, like in the image here, which is in a nearby galaxy called the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is very metal poor compared to our own. So Ulysses is studying star massive stars in these low metallicity regions uh, in order to understand how the absence of these heavy metals uh, or heavier elements uh, changes the way the star behaves with its environment. Uh, it changes the speed of the wind. It changes the energy that it injects into the environment. And we have to use spectroscopy to do this. Uh, so here's a, a plot showing the spectrum of a couple of stars in this image. Um, one plotted in blue, one plotted in green, um, or maybe purple instead of blue. Uh, but when we look at these fingerprints, these chemical fingerprints in the wind, the width of that fingerprint tells us the speed of the wind. So the wider the fingerprint is, uh, then the faster the wind is going. And that's just a Doppler effect um, that you're getting the redshift and blue shift as the stuff is expanding. And the, the faster it's going, the more it gets redshifted and blue shifted and the wider the line gets. Um, but UV is also important for learning about extreme environments like black holes. Um, if you look at a black hole, you've got this, uh, the ones we can see anyway, have stuff falling into them. Um, that's how we can see them. And so as that stuff spirals in, it makes an accretion disk uh, and it gets so hot, it drives winds out of the accretion disk. Um, it also will create these jets that launch out into space. Um, and this happens for the supermassive black holes and it happens for the ones that are the dead remnants of stars. Uh, so very different scales. Uh, the dead remnants of stars will be maybe 10 times the mass of the sun. The supermassive ones in the centers of galaxies will be more like a million or a billion times the mass of the sun. Um, but if we look at kind of one of the small black holes even, a lot of the material that starts to get dumped onto the black hole actually will get ejected again through the wind. Um, and that wind is very bright in the ultraviolet. So understanding the ultraviolet light of these systems will tell us about the material escaping from the black hole's accretion flow. Um, so it's, it's again, it's part of the puzzle that we need to complete our picture. Um, and just to reiterate again, you know, Hubble and Webb have very complementary um, modes, right? Hubble is studying ultraviolet, Webb is studying more infrared, uh, and it's two you know, parts of a team here. Um, Infrared light is kind of piercing the dust and is telling us about the dust behavior. Uh, UV is telling us about the energetic feedback that's hitting the dust. Um, so together, they're giving us a more picture, a more complete picture of star formation, galaxy evolution, uh, and other fields of study as well. Uh, oh, and I've got some extra slides there that I can get into if there are questions. But I'm going to go ahead and take a break for questions now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. That was a very like phenomenal presentation. I don't know too much about uh, ultraviolet light in the study with astronomy, and that was a, that was a great introduction. So thank you so much. Um, yes, I learned a lot too, Candice. Awesome. I, I just want to open it up now. You know, if there's any uh, questions for Chris about what we've learned here, um, anything more you'd like him to go in depth with, feel free to to ask away. And just to let you all know, I'll share out the resources that he, he listed here too, after. So does the age of stars, like population one stars and two stars, show a marked difference in metallicity? So you're, you're saying that the older, the older stars, the older generation stars, the metallicity is, is much lower? Yes, that's that's absolutely correct. Yeah, the uh, there, there's a marked difference in the metallicity there, uh, which means that they they behave differently as well in terms. So of how so how does that affect the UV output of a star? Or that's a great question. Um, mostly, what it ends up changing is the how well the UV light couples to the material in the outer atmosphere. Um, that if you have more metals. Basically, that those have more electron slots. Those have more spaces for electrons to go. And that means that there are more ways for the light to push on the atom. And so you get stronger winds with the same UV. 
Uh, so the older stars that were made with fewer metals end up with weaker winds, um, which, which you know, impacts the strength of feedback in an early galaxy. So if we wanna study things in the early universe, which Webb is, is doing, uh, we need to be able to understand uh, the interface between the, the star's light and the gas and dust around it. Because um, Webb is kind of studying UV in the early universe, right? If you go back to redshift 10, uh, infrared is rest frame ultraviolet. But Webb can't see the individual stars that far. It can kind of see the galaxy as a whole. Uh, so Hubble's kind of giving us the detailed ultraviolet stuff nearby that we can take those lessons and apply to Webb's images of the early universe. Thanks. Awesome. And Chris here, we have a question in the chat from Carrie. Uh, what do you think would be a good way to demonstrate ultraviolet UV with light and how telescopes use it to see in space? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think there's some good hands-on activities that uh, are available through NISENET that deal with ultraviolet. Um, and I, I think a lot of those deal with uh, things like fluorescence or pigment changes. Uh, I know like we have some some colored beads we'll sometimes use for events that are white uh, unless they are exposed to ultraviolet light and then they turn into different colors. Um, and what's happening there is the ultraviolet is actually striking the pigment molecules and breaking a bond uh, and causing it to change shape and that changes the color. Um, so things like that where you get a very noticeable change coming from uh, the introduction of ultraviolet. Um, you could use... Uh, I think soda water as well uh, will fluoresce in ultraviolet. Um, so that's something to, you know, to compare the difference between like an ordinary glass of water and the soda water. And to add to those UV beads, Chris, I'll point out it's a fun activity to add, bring out some sunscreen, right? Yeah. Um, talk about the importance of sunscreen. If you cover a few of the beads in sunscreen and some not, uh, that's a great way to kind of extend that activity. That's a great idea, yeah. See, do we have any activities adapted for pre-K students? Hmm. Yeah, those beads would not be good for pre-K into the mouth, but uh, yeah. Um, the water might be good for them, um, the two glasses of water. I'm, uh, I think that's a nice net activity uh, as well that, that could still work. I mean, it would have to be adapted. I don't think it's written for pre-K, but you know, I, I think the glasses of water would be safe at least. Maybe end up messy, but... Awesome. But that's uh, a great request, and we'll have to throw that around with the Universe of Learning team and see if we can uh, kind of help come up with some ways to adapt that for pre-K, because knowing that that would be wanted and useful is something really, you know, we want to take exactly. that late. Yeah. All right, perfect. Well, we're just right at the 30 mark, um, so I don't want to hold people here uh, unnecessarily long, but I thank you all for attending. And like I said, this is recorded and I'll share out after the resources that Chris has explained here, as well as some more on ultraviolet. And thank you all for your questions. And thank you, Chris, for giving this phenomenal presentation. Really appreciate it. Yeah, and um, I'm available by email as well if anybody has any further questions or anything. And Jesse has my email. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us, Chris, and we'll see you all next month. Yes, yeah, see you next month. All right, bye-bye.